Welcome to Rappahannock Community College. My name is Dan Ream and I'm the head of the library for RCC and for Richmond County Public Library. Uh, for those of you I haven't met, I hope I'll get to meet you tonight if you stay after and, and linger a bit afterwards. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome back to Warsaw, our, our Warsaw's prodigal son, Tom Robbins, known here as Tommy, as you may have noticed on some of our signs in town. That's maybe the only place he's known as Tommy. I'm not sure we can maybe find that out. Mr. Robbins grew up in Warsaw in the 1940s. Tonight is his first public appearance in our town since he graduated from high school in 1949. In other words, he has been back, but not in a forum like this before. I hope you've enjoyed looking over your, our program tonight. Did you all get a copy of the orange cover? Uh, for those of you who are in that other room, uh, again, welcome. I'm sorry, I tend to be camera oblivious uh, sometimes, but welcome as well. Uh, I hope you enjoyed seeing there the material from the 1949 Warsaw Yearbook. We thank uh, Chip Delano for sharing that with us, and also the interview from the Northern Neck News. And thanks to also the staff of Northern Neck News for, for supporting us and having been doing that. Also, please note in our program the back page, which thanks many people who really work really hard to get everything up and running tonight, especially our technical crew to get all the wires working and all the sound, and I hope again those of you in the overflow area can hear and see us just fine. If you'd like to help our library continue offering community programs like tonight, please consider making a gift to Rappahannock Community College or joining our Friends of the Library group. Both the college and the library friends do great work in making Warsaw a better place to live. Membership forms to join the Friends were included in your packet, and also we'll have a table outside in the hallway after uh, Mr. Robbins is finished speaking tonight. Most of all, I want to thank Tom and Alexa Robbins for agreeing to come. In terms of introducing Mr. Robbins, I'm afraid I lack the eloquence to really do him justice. So I actually asked him before he came, how can I introduce you? And he offered me this. This is uh, me, myself, me quoting Tom Robbins. Whether they love me or loathe me, one thing on which critics seem to agree is that I mix fantasy, spirituality, sexuality, humor, and poetry in combinations that have not quite ever been seen before in fiction. Personally, I believe that this mixture paints a pretty accurate picture of the real world. Some years ago, a young female reader wrote this to me. Your books make me think, they make me laugh, they make me horny, and they make me aware of all the wonder there is in the world. I couldn't ask for a better response. Please welcome Tom Robbins. We have, we have two guests tonight who are here to greet Mr. Robbins. First to wish our president of Rappahannock Community College, Elizabeth Crowder. Robin's Day in Warsaw. Happy day so far, but the night's still young. Uh, well, we're, we're just so thankful you came. We're thankful to Rusty Brown for writing you a, a letter and saying, please sign my, my book label. And, uh, and that precipitated Dan, of course, jumping on that and saying, well, why don't you just come here? So um, we, none of us can refuse Dan. So we're, we're awfully glad that you struck up a relationship and that, that it ended up with your being here tonight. So thank you, Dan. Uh, he did and, not have to twist my arm. Yeah. <laughs> so we're just excited to death to have you here. And I know you're, you're um, uh, happy to be back, particularly at this time of year. One of the stories I've heard in the last couple of days has to do with acorns and acorns being thrown at a house here. Uh, I know. So, <laughs> I'm going to leave. It was an acorn. It was walnut. A walnut. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, and I'll leave it up to you to tell the stories. But I just want to say thank you for being here, and we, we love it that you're going to be with us tonight. So, thanks. Thank you. Also with us tonight from representing the Town Council of Warsaw, we have Dr. William Washington, Town Councilman, with a proclamation from the Town of Warsaw. <laughs> Dr. Washington. 
hold this for you since your hands are full. <laughs> All right, yeah. Um, I challenged myself, since I'm going to read a proclamation to a, an outstanding writer, to write something. So I wrote something this is for you, man. I just wrote this. Right, just freestyle. <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you for having me. My name is William Washington. You got that right. <laughs> um, town councilman and assistant principal of Rappahannock High School in Warsaw. And you can gain that. <laughs> um, so we have a game tonight, and I'll, I have to leave as soon as this is done. As soon as I'm done with this, so two places at once. But in preparation for this honor of reading a proclamation for Tommy Robbins, I reflected on why I'm not a writer myself. <laughs> what am I missing? I googled it. <laughs> After sifting through countless blogs, message boards, and Wikipedia entries, because I'm only interested in quality reliable sources, I arrived at a synthesis that suggests the following findings. Writers end up telling their own stories rather than reading them to people. If your child always asks you to put down the book and make up an original story of your own, you're probably a writer. And number two, writing has to pull at your soul. You consider writing to be a long time, part time job. None of this applies to me. I've always read books to my daughter who always fell asleep just as I got to the interesting parts. And whenever I write something, even I don't want to read it again. So I applaud the skill that Tom Robbins has. Um, it's one thing to write an interesting passage, but to compel someone to read a page and anticipate what comes on the next page, that's another thing. Now, imagine compelling someone to turn the page more than 100 times to see what's on the next. That's what Tommy does, and that's why thousands of people make it through his books. <laughs> so, I have the great pleasure to read the following proclamation and present it to Tommy Robbins today on behalf of the, of the town of Warsaw and the War Warsaw Town Council. I didn't want to pick up the large things. So I have a little small piece of paper. <laughs> Since I left over there. <laughs> you didn't see anything. <laughs> 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 uh, this was written by the mayor. He could not be here today. Um, whereas Tom Robbins is an internationally renowned American author who has been honored by being named one of the best 100 writers of the 20th century and received the Literary Lifetime Achievement Award from the Library of Virginia. And whereas Tom Robbins was born in Statesville, North Carolina on July 22, 1936, to George Thomas Robbins and Catherine Bell Robinson, and then moved to Warsaw, Virginia, and whereas Tom Robbins spent much of his childhood living in a home located on Hamilton Boulevard in the town of Warsaw, Virginia, and collected many memories which helped shaped his persona. And whereas Tom Robbins graduated from Warsaw High School in 1949, high school <laughs> from Hargrave Military Academy in Chatham, Virginia in 1950, and then enrolled in Washington Lee University, and later left to join the United States Air Force, from which he was discharged in 1957. And whereas Tom Robbins graduated from RPI in 1959 with a degree in journalism, and briefly worked for the Richmond Times Dispatch before moving to Seattle in 1962, where he received his master's degree from the University of Washington. And whereas Tom Robbins published many books after settling in Washington, including even cowgirls, get the boots. <laughs> <laughs> and his latest book, Tibetan Peach Pie, in which he speaks of Warsaw, Virginia and tells the many stories he had in his childhood at home. Now, therefore be it resolved that the citizens of Warsaw, Virginia and the Warsaw Town Council wish to recognize Tom Robbins on this special day and extend their sincere congratulations on his many accomplishments and achievements. As mayor of the town of Warsaw, I, Mark Milstead, do hereby proclaim Friday, October 16th, 2015 to be Tommy Robbins Day.
Thank you, Dr. Washington. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. And without further ado, I give you Tom Robbins. such a treasure being back in Warsaw, a day where I've not only seen people, but houses and buildings and trees, you know, part of the landscape of my boyhood memories. Um, I came to Warsaw in the sixth grade, in the seventh grade, all four years of high school, two years after graduating from high school. And um, so I spent my formative years here. And <clears throat> I uh, admit that I have been a bit of a rebel and a nonconformist, not only in my writing, but in my personal life. And since I spent my formative years here, it is your fault. <laughs> <laughs> and I thank you for that. <laughs> Before I read a little from the book, I thought uh, I might give you an introduction to uh, what, I, what I think I am and do as a writer. <clears throat> Short. The tin can was invented in 1811. The can opener wasn't invented until 1855. <laughs> <laughs> True. In the 1844 years, Whitby diners had to access their pork and beans with a hammer and chisel. <laughs> Suspecting that much of mainstream literature, not to mention network television, studio movies, social media, Socialism, Marxism, corporate consumerism, corporate government, corporate religion, and at least 75% of self-realization techniques could be a collection of dull chisels and rubber hammers. <laughs> My aim has been to try to write novels that might function as can openers in the supermarket of life. <clears throat> or, changing metaphors in midstream, I could say that my goal has been to twine ideas and images into big subversive pretzels of life, death, and goofiness <laughs> on the chance that they might help keep the world lively and give it the flexibility to endure. But while I may compare my little books to can openers and pretzels, to hallucinogens, aphrodisiacs, mood elevators, intellectual garage door openers, and metaphysical trash compactors, claiming they might do everything but rotate your tires, <coughs> what they and I may ultimately be about is the celebration of language. That magical honeycomb of <coughs> words into which human reality is forever dissolving and from which it continually reemerges, having invented itself anew. The adjective in the lotus, the jewel in the eggshell, <coughs> a blue dolphin leaping from a sink of dirty dishes. <laughs> <laughs> secret kind of titillation. <laughs> and I'm going to read to you tonight some of the parts in it that pertain to this community. <clears throat> Summer lay on the rural southeast like a sheet of flypaper. Men, dogs, farm animals, commerce, time itself seemed stuck to the page with a yellowish narcotic glue. Hours, days, weeks 
drank by as slowly as a celebrity divorce. <laughs> Only we kids with our sandlot ball games, our dips in the river, seemed the least bit animated. But by August, we too had surrendered to the torpor, <clears throat> our whoops and wahoos gradually softening to a fly-like buzz. Even in thunderstorms, cooling and greening occasionally enlivened the scene, yet no sooner had the last raindrop plumped, the last lightning bolt kicked its, kicked its spastic leg, than heat and humidity, ever sure of themselves, once again assumed office. And by mid-morning, the countryside would have gone back to looking as if it had been fried by Colonel Sanders. <laughs> Considering that there was no air conditioning to evaporate the sweat, considering that there was no television to relieve the tedium, considering that the church, while dominant in the life of the community, was not exactly a barrel of fun, <laughs> it's hardly surprising that when a circus or traveling carnival hit town, a great many residents shared in my delight. Sure, there were a few righteous citizens who'd snort, frown, turn their backs, quarantine their children, and take refuge in their clapboard bungalows, praying against the threat of contamination by godless frivolity. But if you'd spy at night from behind the hydrangea bushes or broken down clunkers in their yards, you'd catch them at the window. Lace curtains pulled slightly aside, ears cocked, nostrils twitching, unable to resist, stealing a look, a listen, a sniff at just how gleefully the devil had transformed an innocent schoolyard or disused field. <laughs> well, maybe it was the devil. Maybe it was the angels. Maybe it was just a bunch of otherwise unemployable guys and girls from down in Florida somewhere. <laughs> but Transformed is the proper verb. What had been a dusty, forlorn acre, carpeted in clumps of half-dried grass, bestrewed with clods, empty beer cans, and tumbling tumbleweeds of crumpled newspaper, inhabited by shabby sparrows and lazy grasshoppers, that unappetizing pasture would have been alchemized and less and a day transformed into a strange but beguiling pleasure park, a rollicking, incandescent oasis of otherness, promising rewards outside the range of normal expectation. It's no wonder, then, that <clears throat> transformation was to become a fairly prominent theme in my novels. The way that colored lights and bouncy music Ferris wheels and performing elephants could temporarily turn an empty Virginia field into an encampment of marbles was not unlike the way an affluent summer migration periodically turned Blowing Rock, North Carolina from dog patch into Swankville. <laughs> the lesson was the same. This program is subject to change. Often unexpectedly, sometimes in the batting of an eye, it's the best argument I know against suicide. Blazing, bustling midway of the Northern Neck State Fair in Warsaw, the sideshow barker, now an obsolete term for years show people have called him talkers, was enticing crowds of gawking rubes with ornate, exaggerated descriptions of the oddities and wonders allegedly assembled inside his tent. Among the attractions was a genuine, living midget. <laughs> a rosy-faced, tuxedo-attired gentleman of somewhat less than normal height. 
who had joined the Tarka out front to personally demonstrate that there truly were startling examples of Mother Nature's cruelties to be seen inside by those rubes who accepted the invitation to step right up and lay their money down. <laughs> Talkers, obviously, talk. And this one talked so rapidly, so incessantly, that when he died, I'm sure they had to beat his tongue to death with a stick. <laughs> in the midst, however, of explaining that despite the midget's deficiency in stature, he was an intelligent and talented human being, as if to prove the point, the midget with a cigar, the talker abruptly stopped talking. He stammered a few incoherent words, then fell mute again. From the booth where I sold tickets for rides on the whip, I had a good view of the sideshow tent, and I knew what had silenced the talker. I'd been expecting it. <laughs> the Tidewater village of Warsaw resembled the mountain village of Blowing Rock in that no persons of color resided there. Unlike Blowing Rock, however, there were scores, perhaps hundreds, of African Americans living in what amounted to rural shanty towns within a couple miles of the municipal limits. While during the week <clears throat> a scattering of black faces might be seen in Warsaw, cleaning women and laborers, laborers mostly, on Saturdays there was an ebony tide. They came into town to shop and to socialize, hanging around the Texaco station, talking, laughing, drinking soda pop and brown bagged whiskey, listening to the soul sounds, called race music back then, that blared from the countertop radio until the place closed around 11 p.m. The Lucy Lucy Texaco station being the only establishment in Warsaw where Jim Crow constraints were unenforced. I'm residing somewhere in the unlit, unpaved, hope shop, chigger scratchy environs of Warsaw, a place that some of you may know today as Scott Town, <clears throat> with a family of black midgets. There were four, maybe five of them, male and female, siblings possibly, though the precise nature, nature of their kinship was impossible to know. They always came to town together, never, never singularly, accompanied by several full-sized chaperones or protectors, and they didn't come in very often, maybe a half dozen Saturdays a year. It seems they didn't appreciate being gawked at, which though understandable, sprinkles a fine pepper of irony over their visit to the Northern Nick State Fair. Now let me explain, when I say midgets, I mean midgets. <laughs> I'm talking extreme midgetry. Midgets among midgets. Jaw-dropping diminutive. Seriously, I'll eat this page and wash it down with kerosene if any one of Warsaw's little people was so much as a mouse hair taller than Michu, for years a star attraction with Ringman Brothers' Barnum and Bailey Circus, billed as the world's smallest man. His shoe's height was 33 inches. So, when from my fairground vantage point, I witnessed the Warsaw midgets slowly approaching the sideshow tent, I fully anticipated the talker's shock and embarrassment. There he was, raving on and cascading hyperbole about what a rare specimen of humanity this midget was. How privileged were the roofs to behold such a phenomenon. And he, and eventually the roofs, caught sight of a whole troop of beautifully formed chocolate miniatures. <laughs> <laughs> Not one of whose head would reach as high as the sideshow midget's nipples. <laughs> Was it pure coincidence for the gods having sport, as is their wont? Or had our midget family planned the whole thing, either as a silent protest against both the commercial exploitation of the physically peculiar and the dishonesty of ballyhoo, or despite their customary shyness, 
as a prank, <laughs> an, unchar an uncharacteristic display of mischief and fun. Had they gone back to their shanty town that night and laughed their tiny butts off? <laughs> we'll never know. <laughs> Although the gossip among the midway carnies was that the show boss had followed them home, returning there the next day and the day after, ever sweetening his offer to make the lot of them rich and famous that they'd just sign on with him. To their credit, they did not. Meanwhile, back at the fairgrounds, I watched the talker wax visibly nervous each time he was joined out front by the upstaged fellow some of us had taken to call him the world's tallest midget. <laughs> <laughs> Since uh, we're not very far from Halloween, um, I thought I would read this Halloween story. As a teenager in Warsaw, I was found every Halloween among the group of boys that gathered after supper in the center of town intent on mischief, percolating with an unconscious longing to invoke and flirt with those fearsome forces that haunt the mortal shadows of being. On the other hand, it may just have been a bunch of bored kids looking for a break in small town routine, looking to cut loose for a night, looking for a little excitement, for kicks. Despite their rowdy nature, these rallies were fundamentally devoid of malice, were reflective of an actual kind of innocence. Yet, as I can report firsthand, they did not always produce a happy ending. As we boys, armed with bars of soap and rolls of bathroom tissue, milled around Warsaw's main intersection, waiting for Clanton's drugstore to douse its lights and close for the night, the intersection's other businesses had gone dark at six, we were inevitably joined, <coughs> or rather confronted, by an adult male in a suit and tie. That would have been Mr. Willie Jones, the Commonwealth Attorney for Richmond County, a jolly, humorless, middle-aged man whose fairly affluent residence was a scant two blocks away. Jones would puff himself up, survey us disdainfully, and address us in a painfully slow southern accent, so swimming in hog gravy that it elicited it elicited giggles from us boys, even though all of us spoke fluent Dixie. <laughs> Save I, who before mentioned sounded like an Oklahoma bug doctor trapped under a spud truck. <laughs> I am ordering y'all, Brother Jones would announce, to disperse this assembly immediately, or I will prosecute every last one of y'all to the fullest extent of the law. <laughs> Jones's threat would be greeted with hoops and jeers. He would then repeat it, emphasizing the prosecute part. And gradually, in pairs or groups of three or four, boys would peel away from the main body, only to regroup, though we always lost several Freddy cats, around the corner and down the street in front of the B&B pool room. The only establishment in town aside from the movie theater and the Negro-friendly Texaco station to remain open after 8 o'clock. <clears throat> it was a yearly ritual. Willie Jones would strike a vocal blow for the rule of law and the forces of good. Then we frankly laughable rep representatives <coughs> of the dark side would scatter later to slip and sneak around the residential streets, banging on doors, tipping over garbage cans, in every minor havoc. One October 31st, however, it was my senior year in high school, the routine took an unfortunate left turn, <coughs> paving the way for the end of Halloween <coughs> fright and the advent of Halloween light in Warsaw forever. 
Wishing perhaps to put some distance between ourselves and Willie Jones, or so soul cop always seemed to conveniently vanish at Halloween, eight or nine of us found ourselves a half mile or so <coughs> from the heart of town. Out where residences petered out and croplands began. Be it by chance or subliminal design, we were gazing across a field at a large white farmhouse occupied by an unmarried school teacher and her bachelor brother. Andrew Garland, a gruff old bird, had retired from surveying to devote all of his time to the farm. His sister Claude, a severe stout woman who had been teaching typing, shorthand, and bookkeeping at Warsaw High School since practically the demise of clay tablets, <laughs> was known to everyone, young and old, as Miss Claude. <laughs> Motivated by no spoken plan, we advanced to within 40 feet of Shea Garland, finally pausing beneath a black walnut tree, <coughs> very tall and likely older than all of us put together. The actual black walnut nut, hard and gifts of shell, was contained inside a thick, pulpy husk about the size of a handball, a perfect size, alas, for throwing. As there were walnuts aplenty on the ground, it wasn't long before silently, spontaneously, our puppet strings pulled, perhaps, by the demonic spirits of Halloween, ancient, autumnal, arboreal. We commence to hurl the walnuts against the side of the house. So far, so good. We seem to be successfully creating the very kind of loud, hopefully scary, ultimately harmless racket that was ever our goal on these annual nights of fright. But then, but then there was a new sound clink, followed instantly by a cascade of icy tinkles, <laughs> as if a cheap music box had imploded inside a freeze locker. <clears throat> the noise was repeated over and over. Encore, encore. From inside the house, <clears throat> there came a sound disturbingly akin to a scream. Abruptly, the tinkling stopped. We froze. The night, the earth, the universe slammed on its brakes. Time sucked on a chloroform popsicle. <laughs> we gaped at one another, neither in triumph nor terror, neither with bravado nor indifference, but with a peculiar kind of disbelief. Then, like a flock of starlings, we whirled as one and took off for town. <laughs> our young legs covered a lot of ground quickly, but the news of our foul deed got there ahead of us. <laughs> By the time we reached the B&B &B pool room, Lester Scott's father and Bernard Packett's older brother were already sitting out front in their pickup trucks, engines idling. And less than a minute later, Lester and Bernard were hauled away. <laughs> when we looked up the street, and glimpsed Willie Jones conferring with our local lawman beside his patrol car, the rest of us developed a sudden yearning for the comforts of heart and home. <laughs> <laughs> Every upstairs window in the Garland house comprised a dozen nine by 11 inch panes. How many of those were shattered, I could not say. Reports ranged from five to 25 depending on who was talking, and none of us boys were talking much at all. <laughs> the number, however, was not really the issue. The more relevant question was, why? Captain Mandrew, as he was called, wasn't the most gregarious of men, but certainly none among us bore him ill will. As for Miss Clogg, she had a reputation at school as a stern dis disciplinarian, but nobody ever called her unfair or unkind. Moreover, not a boy in our party had taken one of her classes. <laughs> her mission for at least two decades had been to prepare local girls for office work. 
one of the very few jobs available to young women at that time and in that place. Had we given it a moment's thought, we'd have let out an ecstatic rebel yell that it was the girls, not us, <laughs> who faced the future of balancing ledgers and taking dictation. No, it was not a personal anger nor general resentment of authority that prompted our walnut barrage, nor can it be traced to any inherent meanness. And let's not get carried away with blaming the demonic agents of Halloween, though our assault would never have occurred on any other day of the year. In the end, I suppose it was the confluence of boredom, hormones, and chance opportunity that led to the broken glass an impromptu teenage reach for fresh thrills in small-town post-war America. In any case, for days thereafter, all of Warsaw was abuzz with talk of the Halloween caper. Everywhere we were regarded with curiosity and or disgust. Commonwealth Attorney Jones was hell bent on prosecuting every last one of us <laughs> the boys extend the law. Rumors of impending reform school <clears throat> were widely circulated. Several of our parents got together <clears throat> and hired a lawyer, and I was among those who were disposed, deposed in his office. Eventually, <clears throat> restitution was paid individual letters of apology written. Miss Claude forgave us, and within a month, the evil pumpkins of Halloween had been safely baked in the Thanksgiving pies. <laughs> Although, there were a few of us who would never quite sponge old Jack's tainted smudge from our ledgers. <laughs> now, an octogenarian writer looking back on his life, I find my list of regrets a short one. No doubt, shorter than it has any right to be. Near the top of that list, however, ahead even of a couple of ill-advised marriages, is the part I play in the breaking of this Claude's end of. I take some consolation that in the afterlife, good Miss Claude is busy there with helping the Almighty update his office skills. <laughs> he should ever take a note to write a sequel to his big bestseller. If <laughs> 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 my voice starts to crackle and fade you, been doing that lately, so you don't need to adjust your hearing aid. <laughs> <laughs> it was said of Captain Andrew Garland, he of the Walnut and Window Fangs, that he walked outside one morning, shook his fist at an uncertain sky, and shouted, All right, God, I've got you now. If it's sunny, I'll get up hay. If it rains, I'll plant tomatoes. <laughs> Since tomatoes were the principal cash crop in that area of Virginia, and since Christianity played a significant role in nearly every Warsawian's life, it's hardly surprising that the Almighty would be occasionally in book and in field with a love apples crew. I personally witnessed such an invocation, and a quite effective one, albeit with the opposite intention of the usual agricultural prayer. In my teens, I lived for two successive summers on a farm owned by the family of my high school buddy, Irvin Tackett, where I, along with a half dozen other boys, were hired to pick tomatoes. We were paid 10 cents per basket for green fruit, five for rice. The green ones were destined for the grocery stores and produce markets of Florida, its growing season being the reverse of our own, and they had to be unblemished and of a particular size, whereas the ripe ones, which we'd haul at night to a local cannery to be turned into juice or sauce, had no such restrictions and were thus far easier to pick. 
On a good day, a boy might earn four or five bucks, which could light up a good many pinball machines and add any number of comic books and girly magazines to one's labrorium prohibitorium. <laughs> <laughs> the camaraderie, the camaraderie, moreover, though unspoken, was relished by all of us. And we shared a, a sod, sullied bond strengthened by the perpetual japes and jabs of inane teenage redneck humor. Ah, but as wise men know, a big front has a big back. And the beefiest backside of this summer job was that on July afternoon, if it could get hot enough in those low-lying fields to melt the humps off a camel. <laughs> there were days when the sunshine seemed not only weighty, not only textured, but almost audible. It sounded like drops of oil crackling into combustion, or a blues man dancing on a harmonica made out of lard. <laughs> on one of those days, the heat became so unbearable it apparently called for divine intervention. Lancelot Delano, <clears throat> that was his actual name, though his friends called him Gumbu, <laughs> was a tall, gawky youth, strong as a mule, but sweet as molasses, and just about as slow. <laughs> Lancelot wasn't some kind of simple to mind, he was just perpetually relaxed, <laughs> quiet, but laid back. <clears throat> He was related to two of the pickers, and all of us knew him, even though he had just schooled goodbye in the fifth grade and rarely came to town, even for a movie. Gentle and good-natured, he was never ridiculed, but rather elicited from his peers a measure of rough affection. And one day, the torturously torrid day aforementioned, a kind of awe. The temperature flirted with 100 that afternoon, humidity hard on its heels. We sweated like thawing snowmen, and in our wilting ears, heat made a faint, fuzzy, chirping noise, like the spasms of wounded crickets. <coughs> Bending over the tomato vines as we worked our way down the rows, we were sinking ever more deeply into a miserable stupor, when suddenly, we heard Lancelot Delano's voice addressing the heavens. Good Lord, if it's in thy power, send us that knocking off shower. <laughs> <laughs> what happened next strains credibility. I swear to the truth of it. <coughs> Within 15 minutes or less, the pale blue sky broke out in bruises. Dark tanks of cumulus came rolling in, bucking and heaving like a Russian rodeo. Claws of lightning whipped the turbid bodice. Thunder neighed like all the Tsar's horses. Farmer Packett, our boss, kept glancing up nervously. <coughs> and by his fourth or fifth glance, he had rain on his face. The downpour didn't last especially long. But afterward, conditions in the field were too muddy for effective picking. We happy boys piled into and onto a big farm truck and sped off to the Rappahannock River, where we frolicked in the cool, salty water until supper time. I'm unsure if any of us questioned our doopy liberator about his cosmic connections, <laughs> but for weeks thereafter, I catch boys, including myself, looking at him with something akin to wonder. On several overheated occasions later in life, laboring on a construction site, drilling on a military parade ground, trekking in equatorial Africa, I attempted to duplicate that little meteorological miracle, <laughs> lifting my eyes and muttering, good Lord, if it's in my power, send me that knocking off shower. <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> Not one drop. I lacked both the courage and conviction to speak my prayer aloud. I lacked the pure heart and spirit of Warsaw's sweet Sir Lancelot, St. Gumbo of the Tomatoes. <laughs>
Summer, Tomatoes, Religion, The River, and the actress Natalie Wood are all tangled up in the web of my memory. Let me see if I can separate the strands. In the summer I turned 13 in the Kentucky Derby, it could have been one by a hobby horse. That's how slowly those months dragged by. Too young for gainful employment, even in a tomato gang, I passed the long, steamy days reading, napping, attending vacation Bible school. Y'all. <laughs> Composing with my talking stick. Um, we'll say no more. Uh, but it's revealed in other parts of this book. Uh, impatiently waiting for a Tarzan movie, a circus, or a traveling carnival to find its way to town. Other than that, my primary activity that summer was hiding from Dr. Peters. Pastor of the Warsaw Baptist Church, Dr. Peters was a tall, gaunt, was tall, gaunt, and pale with a weak, damp smile and cold, damp palms. Shaking his hand was like being forced to grasp the flaccid penis of a hypothermic zombie. <laughs> <laughs> and he did always want to shake my hand. <laughs> Whenever he managed to corner me that day. <coughs> I consider Dr. Peters more creepy than refrigerated possum slobber. <laughs> An opinion not shared by my mother, who found him John the Baptist incarnate, <laughs> the ideal shepherd to steer my soul to Jesus. The two of them, Mother and Dr. Peters, believed that very summer, the summer when testosterone first bowed into my plasma, pilot in a red speedboat and scattering large pieces of childhood in its wake would be perfect timing for redeeming Tommy Rotten, my mother's pet name for me. <laughs> and they conspired to facilitate my salvation. At mother's invitation, the good pastor kept dropping by for a glass of iced tea, intent on engaging me in spiritual conversation. Rather quickly, I developed a sense of his impending arrival and a strategy for avoidance that more often than not consisted of me vanishing into the thicket behind my garage, pretending not to hear my name being called. <laughs> a week-long revival meeting was scheduled for mid-August at our church, and on those occasions when I failed to elude him, <clears throat> Dr. Peters would solicit my pledge to come forward during one of the evening services and commit my life to Christ. I wasn't entirely opposed to the idea. While I suppose I would have preferred that Jesus be a lot more like Tarzan, <laughs> I had nevertheless bought into the prevailing view of him as the greatest figure who ever trod the earth, the heroic, loving martyr who would return someday to dispense the true believers their personal rewards. Certainly, I didn't wish to burn, Warsaw's summers were plenty warm for me. And although a description of heaven made it sound disturbingly similar to vacation Bible school, <laughs> only an imbecile would trade a little boredom for the fires of hell. I convinced myself that I loved Jesus and might be worthy of his love in return. But why did Dr. Peters have to be the matchmaker? <laughs> There was a livelier preacher in the area, a rather flamboyant African-American who drove a light blue panel truck on whose sides were painted in fiery red letters several ominous Bible verses, along with the preacher's name, the Reverend Everready. <laughs> Not a joke. Ever so often, the, the Reverend Everready would drive up to the little black friendly Texaco station, fling open the rear doors of his van and step aside as six or seven noisy children, all seemingly under the age of 10, swarmed out and began running wildly hither and yon. The good reverend would oversee the filling of his tank, <clears throat> the checking of his motor oil, this was prior to the advent of self-service, then go inside to swallow Coca-Cola, dig some soul tunes, 
and shift the breeze with the proprietor. After a quarter hour or so, he'd emerge and bellow in his powerful pulpit voice, an operatic baritone so volcanic it could be heard blocks away. All aboard! If you can't get aboard, get a plank! If you can't get a plank, get your ass in the truck! <laughs> The kids would come racing from all directions and dive for the doors just before he pulled away. Now, I never heard the gentleman preach. This was racially segregated Virginia, remember, and there was nary a white face in his congregation. Nevertheless, had it been a rent, the rambunctious Reverend Everready, rather than the cadaverish Dr. Peters offering to drive me to Christ, I'd have been considerably more eager to get aboard to get a plank, to get my ass in the truck. <laughs> well, on a sweltering August night, I sat in a sticky pew, nervously awaiting the call. When it came, I walked in the front of the church. The lights were low. The congregation was softly singing. And along with a handful of other repentants, surrendered my life to Yeshua ben Miriam, the radical itinerant rabbi known to English-speaking Christians as Christ Jesus. My mother was overjoyed. My father, pleased enough. Dr. Peters carved another notch in his pastoral pistol. <laughs> and I, well, I was kind of on pins and needles. What exactly was I expecting? I could not have said with any degree of articulation. I just thought I'd feel somehow different. Oh, I felt good about myself. I felt a certain sense of accomplishment. Felt marginally safer, even. But when I awoke the next morning, there was no aura around the objects in my room, no radiance in my mirror. I was unmotivated to go forth and help the sick and needy. <laughs> and instead of turning for guidance to the family Bible, I found myself reaching for the Hardy Boys mystery novel I'd started to hear to before. Maybe, I thought, nothing has changed because I haven't been baptized. I didn't have long to wait. <laughs> but then a fortnight, I was waiting fully clad. I argued for old clothes, but Mother insisted I don my very best. Into the Rappahannock River, in which Dr. Peters stood up to his skinny thighs. When it was my turn, he told me to hold my nose, placed a hand on the small of my back, another behind my head, said a short prayer, and completely immersed me. I waded to shore, soaked, dripping, uncomfortable, but pretty confident that henceforth I would live my life in virtue and light. <laughs> Impatiently, I waited to be transported, to be transformed, to be illuminated, whatever that meant, actually, and precisely. And a day passed, three days, a week. Was my soul so wicked it was beyond redemption that they shrunk my favorite pants for nothing? <laughs> was I damned? And then it happened. I was struck full force by spiritual lightning. As it turned out, Dr. Peters had nothing to do with it. <laughs> Reverend Everready was not even remotely involved. Nor had Lord Jesus himself hurled the bolt from above. No, my sudden spiritual awakening was, was precipitated by Miss Natalie Wood. <laughs> <laughs> Leaving my twin sisters with a sitter one evening, my parents had allowed me to accompany them to a movie in Calio, a town about a dozen miles from Warsaw. The film, <coughs> entitled Tomorrow is Forever, dealt with the shock, confusion, and heartache that ensues when a soldier, thought to have been killed in battle, returns alive years later, his war-disfigured face unrecognizably altered by plastic surgery, 
to find that in his absence, his wife and presumed widow had married another man. Natalie Wood, then eight years old and pretty, sweet, and vulnerable, played the adopted daughter of the resurrected man, trying to be brave as her young life is squeezed through one emotional winger after another. Okay, it was a Hollywood cheer pump, a celluloid onion chopper, <laughs> yet the film was skillfully executed. And from young Natalie, there rippled, <clears throat> there rippled echo circles of such genuine poignancy that they melted the shadow between make-believe and the real world. I doubt that I cried in the theater would have caused me terminal embarrassment. But on the drive home, as I sat alone in the dark back seat, a few drops leaned their slick bald heads over the window ledge of my chair ducts, glancing around to, to see if the coast was clear. And then, and then something else happened. My sorrow unexpectedly widened and deepened became less focused on the Natalie Wood character, became increasingly comprehensive, enveloped in not only hurt children and suffering innocents everywhere, but also Hiroshima victims, Huck Finn's Jim, our neighbor's recently euthanized cat, and so on and so forth. Natalie's character also embodied a stubborn, contagious hopefulness, and in me, that hope commenced to expand geometrically as well, eventually morphing into something akin to universal love. <laughs> My scruffy whipper snapper heart opened like a sardine tin. My irrepressible, irrepressible kiddish brain sidestepped the dominion of cognitive experiments. I sensed the world in me, and <clears throat> me and the world, felt fundamentally connected, saw the many as all, and the all as one. One and all, bobbing along forever and ever, in an unending, indestructible river of tears and tickles. Breath and meat. And this totally unfamiliar, oceanic stage Momentarily free of self-involvement, conventional knowledge, and pedestrian consciousness, radiating such a vortex of woo-woo love, it would have made St. Francis of Assisi seem like a mink rancher. <laughs> I finally felt saved. And while it was not going to salvation, Mother and Dr. Peters had in mind, I was certain it suited God and Jesus just fine. Blessed be Natalie Wood. <laughs> self-imposed restraining order about writing right now, and could you explain why? Well, about writing another book, I think I said. Right. You know, I have 11 books in print. Isn't that enough? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I very recklessly published my postal address in the preface of this book. Actually, it was in the hardcover, and I did not intend for it to be in this edition, but my publisher forgot to make a change. And so for the past year, I've done little writing but answer letters. Mm -hmm. I think it's time to contemplate my neighbor for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 
In um, Still Life with Woodpecker, you wrote about the last quarter of the 20th century. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on the fact that many of the issues bring up with the environment and patriarchy and capitalism. I was wondering what are your thoughts on how that they are so frighteningly still relevant in this, the first quarter of the 21st century. And do you see any hope for us? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, not much has changed. <laughs> um, there seem to be uh, intent on systematically destroying the planet. And uh, I, as far as I know, there's not a spare anywhere. <laughs> uh, if they can spare, it's easy to despair over that, but uh, I think there's something that each and every one of us can do to perhaps avert that calamity. Although I, don't, I frankly don't I don't want to get into politics. <laughs> I'm not uh, radiating hopefulness. <laughs> but I think that each one of us can live our lives as if those changes were already here. And that's uh, how I intend to live mine. And uh, in, the, in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve are driven out of the garden, driven out of paradise. Uh, and two angels with flaming swords are placed on the other side of the gates to Eden to prevent them from returning. Um, the Buddhists have a very similar story. Uh, in the Buddhist story, the, the angels with the flaming sword guarding the gate are named. One is named fear, and the other is named desire. Not desire as in sexual lust, but as in greed. And uh, the, the meaning of, uh, it, it actually does start to take on a meaning when you name it, the angels, because it is fear and greed that is keeping each and every one of us from living in paradise on this planet now. And if we can find a way to transcend fear and greed, we will all be in Eden. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's my idea. Hi. Um, you know, we're raising our kids here. Um, we have three small kids. and It was really exciting to read your book and, and just have a sense of what it's like to be a child here. And the, the Rappahannock in particular is really an important part of our lives and my, my family's life. And I just wonder a little bit about your, if you have any sense of um, your own connection to the river. Um, and also just wonder like, where you, you would go down to the river, like where you would interact with it, maybe go swimming. Like, I had mentioned you, get, you would go down with some of your friends or were baptized. Repeat that, Dan. He's interested in your connection to the river, I think also particularly in where. Uh, the river right. you would swim or where you were baptized where at the river do you recall where yeah <laughs> at the river no i don't recall we have people watching you on on the screen here in, in our overflow seating area so <laughs> <laughs> and this allows me to put on my librarian costume for a moment. Wow, he is a librarian. Yes. Okay. Um, on too many occasions, I found myself falling in love, or at least in lust, with many of your female characters. I understand that Freud once said that the one question he could not answer was, what do women want? I wondered if you might share your insights on the myth and mystery of the divine female. Science <laughs> <laughs> power and it says, "P.S. And I can never thank you enough for helping me to question authority, choose the path less traveled, and lighten up." <laughs> well. <laughs> I've written a nine novel called The Secret Powers of Women, and I cannot possibly sum it up in a few sentences, even if I knew the answer. <laughs> but I, 
I thank God for them every night. <laughs> One other question we got in writing from our overflow audience outside the room here tonight. Uh, this is for those who haven't read the complete canon uh, of Mr. Robbins' works. This is a reference to, I believe, uh, even Cowgirls Get the Blues. The question is, whatever made you think of thumbs, giant thumbs? <laughs> No, I can. <laughs> uh, I was born with an overactive imagination. <laughs> and, uh, somehow, I avoided having it stripped away by parents and uh, kindergarten and school and uh, college and the military and all the other big stripping agencies. <laughs> uh, I don't know how I managed to hold on to it, but I, I can say with uh, some uh, assurance that the bats in my belfry have been good to me. <laughs> I, I was wondering, any teachers particularly at Warsaw High School that you remember? Any high school teachers that were teachers? helpful in your writing or encouraging you? Any well, particular teachers that you recall? Yeah, I, I remember a, no, a number of them. I think I write about one of them in here. But in case she has living relatives, I <laughs> know <laughs> <laughs> the story is actually very sweet. But it's probably not one that she would necessarily want circulated. <laughs> it's a friendly story. <laughs> and shows respect. <laughs> Other questions? I'm so simple and I can speak loudly. Um, did you get your favorite sandwich today? Last night, I dined at Relish, and uh, as we were waiting for our entrees, we arrived at the table, so an older chef came up to our table with a little platter, and there was a tomato sandwich yeah. <laughs> on Wonder Bread with Duke's mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> the dinner was good, but you couldn't top that sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Tommy, I got something I want to give you. Give it to Tommy. This was in my pictures of, from school. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> okay. This is from her pictures from school. All right, so. <laughs> from the <floor. laughs>
If you're just going home, go to the left. If you go to the right, we have a line in place for you to get to meet with them, to talk. If you'd like to buy a copy of Tibetan Peace Pi, our friends in the library have copies for sale in that line space. Can we have a round of applause?